Church, let us pray. God, we are grateful for the presence of your Spirit, which goes before us and is with us, even when we don't think about it or notice it. And so I pray right now that Spirit would prick our eyes, prick our ears, prick our hearts, that we may receive your good word, that we may receive your conviction, your encouragement. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fish for people. Colin Kaepernick was made to play football. As a hard-working, smart, and focused young person, he started playing at age eight, and by the time he was in high school, not too far from here in Turlock, he was a three-sport athlete who also carried a four-point GPA. When it came time for Colin to consider colleges, being a gifted athlete, he was offered many scholarship opportunities, all of them for baseball. But Colin didn't have the connection, the passion with baseball in the same way. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt his calling was football. Finally, one school and one school only offered him a football scholarship. The University of Nevada, Reno. Not one of the more glamorous football schools, but Colin took that opportunity and ran with it. Following college, Colin accomplished his next goal. He was a second round draft pick in 2011 for the San Francisco 49ers. And for the next five seasons, Colin Kaepernick worked hard and had success despite enduring multiple injuries and his team going through multiple coaching changes. Colin Kaepernick was made to play football even if his younger self didn't know why. The why had names that needed to be said, needed to be remembered. Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Charles Kinsey, Freddie Gray. God called Colin Kaepernick to football, but it wasn't for the reasons so many aspire. Fame, wealth, Super Bowl rings. God called Colin to play for people. In 2016, as a sign of respectful protest, Colin began kneeling during the singing of the national anthem. And as you know, Colin's football career and reputation paid a steep price for this bold act of faithfulness and integrity. During a post-game interview, Colin said, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. And though after that season... Colin was released from his contract and would never be invited to play again. He changed our country because of how he chose to steward the platform God gave him. Colin roused millions into dialogue and action concerning racial justice and police terrorism against black and brown people. And he went on to found and fund three organizations, Know Your Rights Camp, Raw Vision Media, and Kaepernick Publishing. And together, these organizations advance the liberation of black and brown people through storytelling, systems change, and political education. Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fish for people. 
And in the same way, Colin Kaepernick was made for football, Peter, Andrew, James, and John were made to fish. For them, fishing was a family affair. Work passed down from generation to generation, brothers, fathers, and grandfathers who worked with great dignity, working hard, side by side and often through the night, casting nets, pulling nets, yanking fish from nets, and repairing nets. Generations before, there was great pride in having a close-knit family business, but this was not that time. These were complicated times, challenging times. See, fishermen worked very hard, but they were owned by a corrupt, or excuse me, a corrupt occupier, Rome. And Roman law stated, every rare and beautiful thing in the wide ocean belongs to the imperial treasury. In order to fish, they had to be contracted by the government and pay taxes not only on everything that they catched, but also on the transportation of what they wanted to sell. And while fishermen did have some economic resources from what they sold, their social ranking was low. Fishermen and fishmongers were in the same class as moneylenders, both being despised as greedy thieves. Peter, Andrew, James, and John are socially inferior and in an economically murky existence under Roman control, yet all they know is fishing. It was a great communal cost, a great risk, a great sacrifice to fish, but this family work was their calling, and they did it with dedication, even if they didn't always understand the purpose. Jesus saw their dedication, their work, and the ways they too were trapped in a net, the net of empire. And Jesus cut them free, and at once these men understood their calling, that their lives served a bigger purpose, to serve God and be about the work of God's reign in opposition to the reign of empire. Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fish for people. This past Monday, over 100 people sat here in these pews to honor the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. and learn about the ways many in our city have taken the baton from Dr. King, dedicating their lives to the work of justice. Poverty scholar Greta Garcia, otherwise known as Sister Tiny, used spoken word to passionately share her experience of being unhoused offering conviction and challenge to leaders and to us for the ways we have let crapitalism, as Sister Tiny calls it, displace she and many others from their homes and encampments. She spoke of her work in healing community through her words in poormagazine.com and through educating folks on the brokenness of colonialism at her people's school. Nola Brantley shocked us with the statistic that the Bay Area is one of five hotspots in the U.S. for human trafficking. And as a survivor herself, she has dedicated her life to fighting for the freedom of kids trapped in the jaws of sex trafficking. Nola preached for the needs of foster care reform and fighting against poverty through guaranteed income programs. Nola was a walking tornado of compassion, healing, and love. And Delia Gomez, or Coach G, as her kids call her, was enthusiasm, joy, and hope in human form. She teaches boxing to kids as a means of giving them vision and goals and purpose in context where visions and goals and purpose are said to be lost. And she even set up her own makeshift gym in a park to use. And she told us, I didn't ask for permission to do this, she said, 
because we do not need permission to do good or to make progress. In fact, this became the unofficial theme of the morning as activists after activists stood right here telling us of the ways they have offered help, action, and direction in the spaces that others have ignored. You don't need permission to do good. And if you think of it, isn't that what it means to be a follower of Christ? To be a fisher of people? Doing good in the spaces where good has been outlawed? Taking a knee when the powers and principalities are more comfortable with you standing? Fishing for people when empire wants you to fish for money? Commonality of all these folks I've mentioned today is that none of them have asked for permission to do good. Colin didn't ask his coach if it was okay to kneel. Peter, Andrew, James, and John didn't ask Rome or even their father if now was a good time to take off. And the activists we heard on Sunday didn't wait for city leaders to take the lead. Well, how about you? Are you waiting somewhere for someone to give you permission? Because let me be the first to tell you today that permission is never going to come. And if you were raised to be a nice girl like me, acting before you have permission is going to feel a bit off, a little uncomfortable, maybe even a tad wrong. But the thing is, if we wait for permission from anyone but God, we will be sitting on the bank casting nets for smelly fish instead of fishing for people. Dr. King didn't ask for permission to lead the sit-ins in Birmingham that led to his arrest, number 13 of 29. Dr. King didn't ask for permission to lead a march on Washington, a march that drew a quarter million people, a march that demanded an end to racial segregation in schools, racial discrimination at places of employment, and a decent minimum wage. Six-year-old Ruby Nell Bridges didn't ask for permission when she became the very first African-American child to attend the all-white public William France Elementary School. Bree Newsom Bass didn't ask for permission to climb the flagpole at the South Carolina State Capitol 10 days after a white supremacist killed eight black parishioners and their pastor at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston. Cesar Chavez didn't ask for permission when he marched 300 miles with 50 Catholic farm workers and activists from Delano to Sacramento, living their Christian faith under the banner of pilgrimage, penitence, revolution. And by the time they arrived at the state capitol on Easter Sunday, 1966, they were 8,000 people strong, demanding higher wages and better working conditions for farmers. Nelson Mandela didn't ask for permission. Sojourner Truth didn't ask for permission. Harriet Tubman didn't ask for permission. Ida B. Wells didn't ask for permission. Senator John Lewis didn't ask for permission. Marsha P. Johnson didn't ask for permission. Tarana Burke didn't ask for permission. Black Lives Matter founders Patrice Cullors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi didn't ask for permission. Greta Thunberg didn't ask for permission. Reverend Shane Claiborne didn't ask for permission to stage protests demanding an end to the death penalty. Peter, Andrew, James, and John didn't ask their fathers for permission to follow Jesus. Jesus Christ didn't ask the world for permission. 
Instead, our scriptures say he went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people, all without permission. None of these folks asked the powers that be for permission, and hallelujah, they didn't, because if they did, our world would be a very different place. Amen? Amen. And just as they didn't ask for permission, you do not need permission to follow Jesus, to do good, to participate in the radical, subversive, revolutionary good news of the kingdom of God. So friends, ask yourself, how is God calling you in your own location, with your own gifts, to be good news, to do good in your own corner of the earth. Because there is a whole world outside these doors that needs to be freed from the webs of destruction and instead caught up in the nets of God's reign. And God is calling you you to do good and ask for permission never. Follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fish for people. Amen.